I'd like for you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to take some time this morning and read many passages. I think it's significant. You know, during the Christmas season, we take time to read uh, enormous portions of the Word pertaining to the birth of Christ. But what I want you to know is this, that the birth of Christ is only half of the story. What we're talking about this morning completes it. And uh, I want you to follow along with us in the Word. If you don't have a Bible and you would just like to read the Scriptures on the screen, our media team is ready to do that for you as well. And uh, we hope that you'll follow along with us. I was listening the other day to a gentleman on the news channel, and he was taking a survey in a public square. And in his hand, he had a picture of Jesus. Now, we don't have any real pictures of Jesus, but we all have in our mind what Jesus must have looked like because we've seen artists' pictures everywhere in our lifetime. If I were to hold up a picture of Jesus this morning and without telling you it was Jesus, and I were to ask you sitting out here, who is this? Everybody would say, well, that's Jesus. Because we have in our mind the fixture of what he must have looked like by artist conception most of our life. But this gentleman had a picture of Jesus and he was standing in a public square and he was interviewing. He had a microphone in his other hand. And as people were walking up to him or walking up by him, he would randomly stop them and say, hey, I'm taking a survey. Can you answer a few questions for me? Some people would do that. And when they would stop, he would show them this picture. And he said, do you know who this is? And most everybody had no clue. One person said Abraham Lincoln. I could not believe it. And then he asked the question almost in the next breath, what does Easter mean to you? And most everyone that he interviewed had no clue. I want you to think about that because that's the mentality of the world that we live in today. And it's so sad. It's sad. I can remember when we were knocking on doors canvassing this entire neighborhood some 20, 25 years ago. And we got down here off of Brown Road, off of the Jank Road area over there. We knocked on a door. And a 12-year-old girl came to the door. And when the gospel was presented, do you know who Jesus is? She had no clue. And I thought about that. Almost within a stone's throw of our steeple, there was someone who did not know Jesus. How sad, distressing that is. And so for the benefit of the children that are in here today and those of you that are watching by internet and all of you that are gathered here today, it's imperative that we know what today represents. It's imperative that we know what this day is all about. Because I want you to understand that it's not just about the resurrection, even though that's first and foremost. But what I want you to grasp this morning is what the resurrection declares. What does the guarantee of the resurrection mean to you and me? And I want to speak this morning on three incredible guarantees of the resurrection. Hopefully you have the bulletin and you have the notes already in hand when you walked in the door this morning. You should have got one. Those of you that are watching by internet, you got it this morning. Actually, we sent out next Sundays as well and this Sunday's uh, right behind it. And so if you got two this morning, let me clarify that. So you find uh, the one that's for April the 4th and uh, you'll be right on track with us. But three incredible guarantees of the resurrection. And I want to start reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to ask you to be patient with me as I read right through verse 23. We're going to come back and look at three beautiful truths in the Word of God this morning about what the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees for you and I. 
But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that's before us today and how wonderful it was to hear the choir sing for the first time in over a year. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that this crowd this morning is almost breathtaking, and I, I give you the praise for that. And I thank you for everyone visiting here today. Surely it would be our prayer that they would come and worship with us again. But we thank you for the moment that we share right now. And Lord God Almighty, we, we think this morning about the beauty of this day. And I thank you, God, for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. I thank you, God, for raising Jesus up from the grave. And Lord, there's, our hearts are just so full today of gratitude and appreciation. And I pray that everyone listening under the sound of my voice, whether it be by internet or in here today, I pray God would be blessed as well as we think about the beauty of the resurrection. And we'll give you the praise. I pray, Lord Jesus, that if there is someone listening today that does not know you as their personal Savior, they will trust you before they leave or before they close out their internet. Help us, as always, O oh God, not to traffic in the errors of untruth. And we will thank you and give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want you to notice with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I want you to patiently read along with me as I read verses 1 through 23. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel when I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And I will tell you this, let me put a pause button on this just for a moment. If Jesus had only lived and died, and if that had been the end of his story, we would all be in trouble. But I'm glad it doesn't stop there. Verse number four says, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James. And I want you to know that this is when James really became a believer. He did not receive Jesus, his own brother, as the Messiah in the household of Jesus when he was growing up, but it was only after the resurrection that James believed. Then all of the apostles, verse number eight, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I'm the least of the apostles that I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Can we all say that? Had it not been for the grace of God, where would we be? Where would any of us be? And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than all they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain, and your faith is vain, is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope 
In Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ, <clears throat> the first fruits afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. When the angel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary and spoke the words to her that she was going to be blessed, highly favored and blessed among all women, there's no doubt in my mind that <clears throat> she was made aware of the things that were still yet to come. I believe because the Bible says she pondered all things in her heart. And I believe that when the angel began to speak to her about the Messiah, she would be the one that would give birth to the Messiah. I believe that he also gave her a glimpse of what his coming really was going to be all about. It wasn't just going to be about a baby born in a manger. Wise men and shepherds coming to praise him. I'm sure because when the word says that she pondered all things in her heart, that the Holy Spirit not only gave her the vision of the circumstances around his birth, but I believe that the Holy Spirit also gave her a little glimpse of Calvary and a little glimpse of the resurrection. She pondered all things in her heart. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, there's not much mentioned of him in the scriptures from his birth until the time he was about eight days old. When he turned eight days old, Mary and Joseph took him to the temple and Simeon the high priest circumcised him. Then we don't find anything about Jesus from the time that he was eight days old until he was about 12. When Jesus turned 12 years old, we find him in the temple. And the scripture for that, I'm not going to take time to read it today, but it's in Luke chapter 2, verse 42. The Bible says that he was in the temple teaching the doctors and the lawyers and the scribes the words of God, the words of the Lord. Then we find nothing about Jesus from the age of 12 to the age of 30 in the scriptures. These are the silent years of Jesus. But at the age of 30 years old, we find him resurfacing to the top of the pages of scripture where he began his public ministry by performing his first miracle and that would be the changing of water into wine at the wedding of Canaan and Galilee. And over the next three and a half years, the word of God says that he picked, he chose 12 men to help him impact his purpose for coming to this earth. And we know the reason Jesus came was to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's the message that he was preparing his disciples to grasp and to learn. That's what he was going to teach them when he said, drop your nets and follow me. It was this message of seeking and saving that which is lost. And so for three and a half years, he did exactly that. He prepared them for his mission, for his reason for coming. And then finally, his appointed time had come. Jesus, the night before his crucifixion, spent some of his last hours in the upper room with his disciples. Here in this upper room, we find that Jesus instituted what is called the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, communion. We observed that last Sunday here in our church. When Jesus had concluded the Last Supper, he led his disciples down the stairwell of the upper room and they made their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. 
When Jesus led his disciples into Gethsemane, he told his disciples to stay here and pray. He took Peter, James, and John a little farther to pray with him. Shortly thereafter, Judas Iscariot led a band of Roman centurions into Gethsemane, and he placed a kiss of betrayal on the cheek of Jesus, saying, Hail, Master. After that betrayal and they drugged Jesus out of Gethsemane, Jesus would soon feel the pain of betrayal by Simon Peter. After an entire night went by, Jesus was tried illegally six times during the night. Finally, when it ended up back at the hands of Pontius Pilate one final time, after he had declared, I find no fault in this man, he turned Jesus over to the Jews for crucifixion. And with their choice of his death, the scriptures were fulfilled because the Bible says that he would be a man of sorrow, smitten with grief. And certainly that trail of tears engulfed him with unfathomable torture. The way that they brutalized him on the cross. And think about this. All of that that we have just mentioned was the direct result of sin. Everything that Jesus came to do, seeking and saving that which was lost, the entire episode of him coming to this earth, being born of a virgin as the Messiah, all of this was the direct result of sin. The scripture says that because of one man's sin, the condemnation or the curse of sin was pressed and passed down to all human beings. And so Jesus now is taking our place on the cross. I want you to understand that the scriptures declare it is a substitutionary death, a vicarious death. And if you don't get this by now, I pray that you would perk up and really grasp the truth of it this morning. When Jesus died on the cross... He took my place. He took your place. When Jesus died on the cross, he was taking the place of every human being of the world. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, the Bible says this, But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, we had not reached a place of perfection. We have not reached a place of holiness. We had not reached a place of doing good. We have not reached a place of being worthy. None of those things summons Jesus to the cross. He was willing to come. He was willing to die in that while we were yet sinners, every one of us deserved to go to hell. Hell is not a word that many churches use anymore. It scares people, it frightens people, or it's a word that they just don't like to hear about. But I will tell you this, as real as heaven is, heaven is real, you can count on it. It's where Jesus is right now, but you can also count on this, that as real as heaven is, hell is real. Jesus came to spare us from that if we would trust in him. While he was on the cross, he spoke seven times. And here's the thing that I want you to notice. When he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, here is when the gospel is being not only placed in the forefront of our scriptures today, but I want you to know that the gospel is about not only the death of Jesus, but his glorious resurrection. And I want to go back and reread a couple of scriptures here for you. In 1 Corinthians 15, notice with me again in verse 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received of how that Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So what I want you to know this this morning is this, that Easter is not only about Jesus being raised from the dead, and that's first and foremost, but that the resurrection provides three incredible guarantees to every believer, three guarantees that cannot be reversed. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have three incredible guarantees. 
this morning. First of all, you have the guarantee of a Savior. And I want to go back and reread some of these scriptures again. Notice in verse number 1 through 7. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received of how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And this is what I want you to know. This is the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then all of the apostles. And so here's the thing that I want you to understand this morning, that while highly disputed, I'm talking about even now today, not only in the day of Christ, but even right now, while highly disputed and even in some people's hearts and minds still highly rejected, the resurrection of Jesus Christ declares Jesus to be the Son of God. In Romans chapter 1, verse number 4, this is what the Word says. And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. And here's the thing, we can all be assured of great biblical truths. And I thought about this as I was preparing this message for today, all of the world's conquerors, and I want you to think with me just for a moment, all of the world's conquerors have been ultimately conquered by death themselves. All of the kings of the world have been ruled by death. In the scripture, Samson was not strong enough to resist death. Solomon was not wise enough to figure out a way from dying. Methuselah lived 969 years, yet he still died. Here's the point. Only Jesus. He's the only one that's ever conquered death. No other religion today can testify of that. No other religion has a, a leader in their world that has ever rose from the dead. Only Jesus has conquered death. And so first of all, the resurrection guarantees a Savior because Jesus, God's Son, was gloriously raised from the dead. Number two, the resurrection this morning provides the guarantee of our salvation as believers. And I want to emphasize this. When you trust the Lord Jesus as your Savior, listen, you're not latching on to a hope so situation. I've talked to many people about the gospel before, and I've asked the question, are you going to heaven when you die? And I cannot tell you how many people have said to me, well, I hope so. I think so. Listen, when Jesus Christ comes into your heart, he doesn't give you that kind of grace. He doesn't give you that kind of salvation. When he comes in, you know it. When he comes in, you can feel it. That's what Sister Catherine read just a little while ago. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Listen, when he comes in, you will know it. How do you know it? Because your life will radically, dramatically change. You will no longer be the same person. His grace does amazing supernatural things in your heart and in your life. And in this scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 through 20, look at it with me. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Yet in your sins, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, but now is Christ risen from the dead and became or become the first fruits of them that slept. I'm so thankful today that I do not have to spend my entire life wondering, did Jesus really live or does Jesus really live? I'm glad I don't have to do that. Thank God he does live today. And in John's gospel, chapter 14, verse number 19, you see, a lot of people think that this day is only about an Easter bunny or candy. They think it's about a parade or a family get-together, a lot of food. But here's the thing. 
We're celebrating the glorious bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the only way that we could have gone to heaven. Thank God he lives today. John 14, 19 says this, <clears throat> Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live. It's beautiful music Adam just played a moment ago. Because I live, ye shall live also. And in salvation, when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we have forgiveness of sin. <clears throat> we have the pardon for sin. We have an eternal home in heaven. We have a glorious grand reunion promised according to the Word of God. So because of the resurrection, we have the guarantee of a Savior and we have the guarantee of salvation. And lastly this morning, I want you to see number three. The guarantee of a resurrection for us as believers as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 through 23, the Bible says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they are Christ at his coming. If we're not still living when Jesus returns, and by the way, let me give you a news flash here. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming as imminent. I believe we're living in the last of the last days. And I don't believe that because of spooky religion. I believe it because of what Jesus said. <clears throat> He said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, he said, look up because your redemption draws nigh. I believe that the coming of Christ, the second coming of Jesus, the rapture of the church is on the way. I, I, I really believe it's going to be soon. And here is the thing. If, if you're not still living, which I believe is very well possible, Many of you may be, if you're not still living when the rapture takes place and you have passed on, let me say this, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees you and I a resurrection. If we have passed, if we have died before the rapture takes place, the resurrection of Jesus guarantees us a resurrection also. The resurrection guarantees me. It guarantees you if you are in Christ. Listen here, what do I mean by that, in Christ? Because the question is this, are you in Christ today? In Christ means this, that you have been saved. We just read that word in the scripture. It means being born again. It means being washed in the blood. It means being redeemed. It means by being covered by the blood of the lamb. Let me say this. There's no other way to heaven but through Jesus Christ. No matter what celebrity is on a soapbox today, Jesus is the only way to heaven. I'm glad that my soul will not have to spend eternity in the ground. It will not spend the eternity floating around somewhere in the galaxies. Paul said it like this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and you know what? I believe in my heart that the reason, the main reason why you're here today is because you, you also believe that. I don't know that there's many people in this building. I don't know how many people are watching by internet that would believe that Jesus is dead, that Jesus was just a good person, that he was just a historical man, that he was just a good teacher, that he was just a good rabbi. You would be surprised how many people believe that. But I think coming to church on Easter Sunday morning, you're here today, not only because somebody invited you, you're here today because you want to celebrate the bodily resurrection of Jesus. You believe he lived, you believe he died, you believe he rose again for a purpose, a reason. The scripture says this, for if we believe in verse 14 that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. When the Lord Jesus returns, it will be our crowning day. When the Lord Jesus returns, it will be our resurrection day. Because he was resurrected from the dead, those of us who are in Christ, we will also be resurrected from the dead. And those who are lost, those who do not know Christ, oh, they're not going to spend eternity in the ground. They have a judgment day coming as well. But when Jesus resurrects us from the dead, I want to show you what's going to happen for you and me. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, and they'll get this scripture on the screen probably faster than you can turn. But in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, the word says, Who shall change our vile body? This is where we get our glorified body. When we're resurrected from the dead, when, when the trump of God sounds, when the rapture takes place. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And so this morning, here's the thing that I want you to know, and I'm going to ask our musicians to come forward. And that is this, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it guarantees these wonderful three things. It guarantees us a Savior. It guarantees us salvation. And it guarantees us a glorious resurrection as well if we are in Christ. Now, you can only have this kind of guarantee if you have Jesus in your heart. So my question would be this today, those of you that are watching this morning. The word says this is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. I don't know of a better day to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart if you do not know him than right now. On the day that we celebrate what the gospel is all about, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, I don't know of a better day. Now, surely you can be saved tomorrow if Jesus was so give you an opportunity. If you were still here and the rapture's not taking place, there's a lot of ifs there. I wouldn't bank on it. His coming could take place in the next 30 seconds, so don't feel like you got all the time in the world. But when there's an opportunity like there is now, I would beg you that if you don't know Christ as your Savior, that you trust Him today. Let's all bow our heads prayerfully this morning.